Good morning again. That's three good mornings, you know. That's right, Revelation chapter 20. What a great chapter. Revelation chapter 20. My brother is always sending, often, little puns or little thoughts. I think this was on Facebook as well, but somewhere along the line. He sent this. Think about this. This is for you to think about. What ha- you, ever, you ever heard the expression, you scared me half to death? Huh? You've probably used it before. Woo! You scared me half to death. Sometimes when I... Uh, and we're working down here, and my wife is in the office over there next door, and she's working. She got the door shut, and I go in there, and she claims, she claims that I burst in, you know, that I grab the handle and open it, and it makes a racket and stuff, and I open the door to come in, and, and she may say that. John, I wish you would be quieter about it. You scare me half to death, you know, startlers her. Really, I'm just so anxious to see her, and I'm just coming in. (laughs) Well, my brother said this. What happens if you get scared half to death twice? (laughs) Are you completely dead then? I don't know. What happens if you get scared to death twice? Twice. Food for thought. (laughs) I thought it was kind of funny. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together again as we meet together on this first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and our life, to worship you, to sing praises to you honor you. That's what we sing. We're not singing to each other. We're singing to you. God, you're the audience. And to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. To be an encouragement to each other. Especially in the world that we live in. Knowing that this is not our home. We're not going to be here forever. We're going to be in heaven If we know Christ, we're going to be in heaven with you. Together, together as believers in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time together. Thank you for uh, allowing us to have it. Thank you for this building and for the fact that we can be here and meet in, in comfort. And we thank you for that. We pray for those, Lord God, who are uh, not here that normally are. They're traveling. We're praying, God, that you would give them safety and protection on their journey back. We thank you for them. Pray that we would be blessed this day as well. They may even be watching this. We ask for your blessing in their lives. And we ask for your blessing of your word as it goes forth today. Lord, it is the word of God, your word, we seek to know and, and, and want to understand so that we can grow in Christ, because it is faithful, it is true, every word of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In 1947, some of you were around, many of you were not. I was just being born. In 1947, there was a radio show on uh, radio, and it was hosted by Ralph Edwards. The name of it was Truth or Consequences at that time, 1947 and before. And Ralph Edwards was approached by the United States Army as a celebrity. They wanted him to do something as a well-known person on radio They wanted him to do something for the paraplegic soldiers that had been injured so terribly during the war. They were in the Army Hospital, Birmingham in California. 
Rehabilitation Center. He agreed to do that, and Edwards chose a particularly despondent young soldier who had been terribly injured. And it hit on him the idea of presenting before the radio audience this soldier's life on the air. He wanted to integrate the wreckage of his present life now with a happier past that he'd had and then a hopeful future that's still yet to come. Well, he received such positive feedback, enormous positive re- feedback, that he decided to create and produce a new show. It began on radio. It went on radio for about six years, and so good was it that then when television really became more uh, affordable by most people, it went to the NBC network on television, and it ran on television for nine years. And in that show, what he would do is he would bring a guest, sometimes a celebrity, sometimes, many times, just an ordinary person. He would bring them on in front of a live audience, as well as over the uh, television waves. He'd bring that person on, and he would speak to them, and he would give a biography, as it were, of their life. You talk about the past, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of it. He would integrate that with bringing on guests, other people, family, friends, and family, and, and other members that this person had known, and that these people had somewhat influenced his life in some way or another, good or bad. And he would bring them on. He would fly them out from wherever they were and bring them on. And, and the guest was, was, you know, awestruck in that these people were here. And, and many times it led to tears and, and sometimes laughter and other things as he went through their life. And, of course, some of you my age know the name of that show. This is your life with Ralph Edwards. This is your life. Every person that is written about in Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is a book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he or she had done in this life. We're talking about the who in this final judgment, this great white throne judgment of which Jesus is on the throne, of which heaven and earth flee away, as Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3, how it dissolves, everything's gone, there's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. And this great company of people who have been resurrected since the beginning of time are standing before this great white throne and Jesus is going to judge them. We went through that. Ah. And we ended up with the books. The books. We just read about that. They're standing before the great white throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And all those who had been resurrected, the dead standing before the throne, were judged. They were judged according to what was in the book, what they had done. 
we looked at that. I think that's where we ended up there. We said God has books. God has records. It seems kind of peculiar, doesn't it? God has books. He has records. Check that out in your Bibles. It's all through it. All through it. We looked at Exodus uh, chapter 32, 32 and 33, where the children of Israel had built the golden calf and sinned against God terribly. And Moses comes down with the law inscribed on the two tablets of, st- of stone, and he, he's so anger, he throws them down, and they break into pieces, and he grinds them up, and he, and he, the gold, I mean, and he grinds it all up and makes the people drink it, and he's, he's angry with them. But he goes back up to God, and he says, please forgive them. Please forgive your people. He says, if not, blot my name out of your book. But God says, I will blot the names out of those people who have sinned against me. So books were apparent. Books were apparent. So I asked the question, I asked it myself, why books? Why does God have books? Well, I take the word of God literally, unless the Bible in itself teaches or is teaching symbolism or something different. But otherwise, I take it literally. Why does God have books? Records. Somebody might say, well, does God, he's pretty old, you know, does he have a memory problem? (laughs) I answered that. God doesn't have a memory problem, does he? There's lots of verses of Scripture, but one of our favorites, Psalm 139, which speaks about David saying, where can I go? Where can I flee from God? Wherever I go, you're there. I can get to it. Let me read it, the part of it that I got written down there. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. This is one strong stand why we stand against abortion or the murder of an innocent child. Even scientists say that life begins at conception. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Written in your book before they ever came to be. God doesn't have a memory problem. Luke chapter 12, Jesus talking to his disciples. We don't have to look that up, but going to the disciples and, and he goes on to talk about, you know, don't worry and stuff. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Some of us have a few less numbers. But the very hairs of your head are numbered by God. God is infinite. He's all-knowing, all-present. God doesn't have a memory problem. So why books? Why are things written down in the books in heaven? Especially in this scene here, where those are going to be judged according to what is written in the books, the record. Here in Revelation, I'll just read it all. Here in Revelation 20, verse 12, it is the confirmation of one's destiny by means of God's written record. That's why it says, like it's almost like a in parenthesis here as you're reading this verse. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. And then it says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And then it goes back to the first books. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. It's almost like a parenthetical piece in there. It's confirmation. All those standing there will see their names aren't written there in the book of life. Their names aren't written there. 
we shared that song with you. In fact, Rebecca came up to me afterwards. I talked about it last week. I said, probably many of you will not know that song, Is My Name Written There by Mary Kidden. And Rebecca says, we know that song. Hmm. We can sing that sometime. I said, okay, okay. Is my name written there? Mary Kidden wrote that back in the 1800s. Her husband had died in the Civil War. Her second son, the two that she had, died of sickness and disease a few years later. She had to, to make ends meet for herself. There were no careers for women. You couldn't go down and get unemployment or get a job. She began writing poems. Many of those poems were later put to music, and she would sell those poems to make ends meet. And thinking about her husband and her son and herself and her own salvation, and reading that verse in Revelation 20 and verse 12, she wrote that song, is my name written there? Lord, I care not for riches, neither silver nor gold. I would make sure of heaven. I would enter that fold. In the book of thy kingdom, with its pages so fair, tell me, Jesus, my Savior, is my name written there? Lord, my sins, they are many, like the sands of the sea. But thy blood, O oh my Savior, is sufficient for me. For they, your promise is written in bright letters that glow. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them like snow. Is my name written there on the page, white and fair, in the book of your kingdom? Is my name written there? That's why it states that in there. Here's all this great company, this great multitude standing before the throne, the great white throne, the pure throne with the judge on it, going to give out his verdict, judgment. And the books are opened to reveal their life. Another book is there which is a book of life, and is there for confirmation, your name isn't there. Your name isn't there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, in that day many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? We ate with you. We, we cast out demons. We did this. We did that. And Jesus will turn to them and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. It's Matthew 7. So the written record is not for God to see and remember. But the written record there is for each individual, each person to see and remember. Their life, their life story your life story. Things we've forgotten about, maybe. Our life story. We won't be there, praise God, if we're saved. But their life story, it will be there. But I want to talk a little bit this morning about the other book, the book of life. That's a positive thing, isn't it? The book of life. Again, let me read to you Verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The book of life. You know, that book of life is talked about throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture. Old Testament saints. Say by grace, just like we are. Old Testament saints, look at these verses, Psalm 69, a Psalm of David. 
A Psalm of David, and it's a long psalm. We're not going to read it all. A Psalm of David, and he's talking about the enemies, his enemies, and the enemies of God. And he's bringing down accusations and judgment. And many of these verses that are in this psalm were prophetic in that they would be uh, prophesied of, and they were prophecy that was fulfilled through Jesus. Through Jesus. Verse 19. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. Look at verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. John 19. It's fulfilled with Jesus. Verse 25. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. Peter quotes that. In Acts chapter 1, referring to Judas, who betrayed Jesus and left his seat empty in the apostleship. For they persecute me, verse 26, those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt, slanderous. Charge them with crime upon crime, David says. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listened, listed with the righteous. Book of life. May they be blotted out. In other words, never put their name down in the book of life. Daniel the prophet, he's after Ezekiel before Hosea. In chapter 12, in verse 1, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, that is the Jewish nation, the people of Israel, will arise. And there'll be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. And again, delivered, translated salvation, saved, or delivered. Old Testament saints. How about the church saints? You, me, during this church age. All people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior had their sins forgiven because of it. Their names are etched in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. From 2030 or 35 Pentecost until the present time and until Jesus comes for the church again. That's the church age. The church age. Philippians chapter 4. Paul writing to the Philippian church in Macedonia. Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. But he writes to the church that he had visited on a second missionary journey. Remember, he went down to the riverside and found some women there that were there for a little prayer meeting. And they led him to Christ or the full knowledge of the gospel. And then from that, a church came into being. And so now he's writing a letter to that church from Rome where he is in prison. House arrest anyway. And he tells him in verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. No hostility in the church. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help those women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Their names are in the book of life. Revelation, our favorite book. When we were discussing this, and we'll get back to, Lord willing, when we're finished with this, we'll go back to the beginning of Revelation again. In Revelation chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3. Notice what it says. To the angel of the church in Sardis. 
right. And he says in verse 5, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life. From the book of life. I just want you to know that isn't something just peculiar here. It's throughout Scripture. The book of life. There is a book of life. It's in heaven. God has it. If you're saved, your name's written in there. If you're not, it isn't written there. How about the tribulation saints? Those who are going through the tribulation. Daniel's 70th week. The seven years. The heptat, Hebrew word. The seven years of tribulation. Matthew 24, where Jesus says, it will be time of distress such as the world has never experienced and never will again. It's going to be the worst time, and we're headed for it right now. We're headed for it. But there will be those who are saved during the tribulation. Now, when we get back there, I'll show with you that they're not part of the church. But nonetheless, there will be those who are saved. Revelation chapter 7, there's going to be 144,000 witnesses of Christ and the gospel going all over the world and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. People will respond. There will be those who are saved, although the majority will not. And they will follow the Antichrist, the beast, Revelation 13. And they'll receive a mark. Because just without that mark in your hand or on your head, you can't go buy and sell. You can't go to the grocery store. You can't get gas. You can't do anything unless you've got that mark. There's a prelude to it right now in some places. You can't go into the store. You can't go on a plane. You can't do this if you don't have the vaccination card. That's just a prelude to it. You see how easy these things can occur and will happen. Will happen. Tribulation saints. Also 20 verse 4, where we started. 20 verse 4, it's the kingdom, remember? The kingdom, the thousand year kingdom. Verse 4. John said in his vision, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. When? When? Well, it says they had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. So it clearly says who, th- who those people are. Who those people are. Through the tribulation. Tribulation saints. And look at the eternal state. After everything's done. This judgment that we're looking at in chapter 20. The final judgment. The earth has been recreated. Chapter 21 and verse 1. Where John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven, the first earth, had passed away. And he goes on into the eternal state. And what does he say in verse 27? Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That occurs all through Scripture. God keeps records, not because He can't remember, but so you can see. So that you can see. Closing this morning, there's other of God's books that are there too. Verse 12 again, where John says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And he says, The dead were judged according to what they had done in the books. And verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that were in it. 
The grave and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person, bar none, was judged according to what he had done. Now this isn't salvation. These are not people who have been saved by the blood of Jesus. These aren't people that are part of the church or part of the Old Testament saints or anything. These are people from the time of Adam on who never believed, who never trusted Christ, who never accepted God's grace and mercy. And they're judged. And everything about them is written down. Everything they did. Every vile thought. Actions. Words. Everything. And it will be displayed before them. They'll read it. And they will be judged accordingly. Now, God's judgment is always fair. And we may get into this next week when we get into judgment. I believe the Bible teaches and implies plenty of times of degrees of punishment, both literally and, you know, figuratively. Hell is still hell. The lake of fire is still the lake of fire. Some will be punished more severely than others. The book of Hebrews says that in chapter 10, verse 29. How much worse will it be for somebody who has heard the word of God, heard it over and had the, the whole thing explained to them and, and, and could have accepted but didn't, rejected. Knew the truth, but rejected it. We'll look at some other verses too. Where Jesus even says, be worse for you. Worse for you when you come into judgment. If the miracles that had been done here were done in Sodom, they would have repented long ago. We'll look at some verses next week. The books will be opened. This was your life. God will parade it all before. This was your life. If you're saved, if you're a believer, that won't happen. But it will if you're not. This was your life. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clear teaching of it. It's not a man, it's your word. The word of God. Absolute truth. Absolutely right. Nothing wrong. Everything you say is yes and amen. Everything you say will happen just as you determined. I'm praying, God, that everyone here and maybe those listening through YouTube or wherever, or Facebook, will also hear and make definitely sure their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because if it is not, there's only the sureness of judgment before a holy, powerful, awesome God. Bless your word to our hearing. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.